Loneliness and social isolation have been identified as major contributing factors to many health conditions ranging from cardiac issues to mental health problems and mortality. Add to that an aging population, families scattered around the globe and rising health care costs, and loneliness has become a significant societal problem. Joining us now for more, in Chicago, Illinois, Louise Hockley, Senior Research Scientist with the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. And with us here in studio, Susan Pinker, psychologist and author of The Village Effect, How Face-to-Face -face Contact Can Make Us Healthier and Happier. And Barbara Barbosa Nevish, sociologist and associate director of the Technologies for Aging Gracefully Lab at the University of Toronto. And Louise, it's good to have you there on the line from the Windy City. Barbara, first time for you on the program. Susan, a delight to see you again. You were here not that long ago. Thank we you. talked about your book. Uh, speaking of which, in The Village Effect, Susan defines loneliness as the feeling of being bereft, deprived of intimacy, of hungering for companionship, as opposed to the physical state of being alone. And Louise, let me just start with you. I'd like to start with the out-of-town guests first, just to get them into the mix here. Uh, anything you would add to that definition of loneliness? No, that's a very useful definition. I would add to that that the element of control or choice is important. People can be alone and not feel lonely if they're choosing to be alone. It can be a great time of rejuvenation, of creativity. Um, you can think of choice in terms of personality differences. People who are introverted might spend a lot of time alone, or relatively alone, compared to an extrovert. But they're not necessarily feeling lonely because it's their choice to have a smaller network. Barbara, we're in the Facebook generation now. So if you are socially connected, does that necessarily mean you're not lonely? No. <laughs> I can be socially connected. I can have several friends. I can meet with them frequently, but I can still feel lonely. And this is because social isolation and loneliness mean different things. So social isolation is the lack of quantity and quality of social ties, low levels of participation in social activities, feelings of loneliness, and lack of social support. Whereas loneliness is more, um, like Susan said, more a subjective feeling of not belonging, of lacking companionship. So social isolation may lead to loneliness, but loneliness does not depend on social isolation per se. Now, the sociological community makes a difference between socially connected and social connection. So there's a difference between social connectedness and social connection. Social connectedness means that we have meaningful social relationships. Relationships that bring us joy and support and satisfaction. Which being a Facebook friend may not quite be enough. Exactly, exactly. Hmm. Do you find it odd in a world where we are, you know, the world's never been smaller. We have never been more connected, technologically speaking. And yet loneliness is a massive thing right now. You want to explain that for us? And it's not only a massive thing, it's increasing, Steve, because about 30, 40 years ago, we had many more people we could depend on, which are our intimate networks, the people who are really important to us. And we also had more people that we met throughout our day, you know, at work, at school, when you bought your newspaper, nobody does that anymore, you know, when you bought your groceries. And so two kinds of networks have declined the kind of network where you're close to people and see them often in person. So we used to have about three people we could depend on at times of trouble. Now we have two or fewer. Hmm. And what are called the integrated networks, meaning the casual acquaintances that you have when you join a club, for example, or you participate at church or synagogue or in a volunteer group. And both of those are extremely important. Hmm. Uh, you may have heard a voice in the background there. It belongs to, in New York City, Judith Shulovitz. She's contributing editor, uh, excuse me, contributing opinion writer at the New York Times and author of The Lethality of Loneliness as published in the New Republic. And Judith, uh, as I welcome you to the program, let me read something from your article, The Lethality of Loneliness, and then get you to comment more on that. Sometime in the late 50s, Frieda Fromm Reichmann sat down to write an essay about a subject that had mostly been overlooked by other psychoanalysts up to that point. She figured that loneliness lay at the heart of nearly all mental illness and that the lonely person was just about the most terrifying spectacle in the world. So Judith, the question coming out of that is if people have known for a half a century that loneliness is a significant thing that affects your health, how come it seems only now to be uh, really reaching the public's consciousness in a major way? Well, I don't know if I agree that it's only now reaching the public's consciousness. I think for the past half century, we've been aware of the importance of love and attachment 
in the development of the baby and of, of the child. But what's new and what's newsworthy is that loneliness, even when you're an adult, can actually have a direct impact on your physical health. And I think breakthroughs in uh, genetics, breakthroughs in immunology, all kinds of breakthroughs have made it possible for us to now measure the, with, with great precision, the impact of loneliness on long-term health and, of course, psychological health as well, and, and even uh, measure its effect on your likelihood to die younger. So that's a little startling, and I think that's why the media have picked up on it. Susan, was there a particular something, a particular event, a happening that made you decide, this is something I need to explore and write about? Yes. You know, when I finished my last book, The Sexual Paradox, there was a puzzle that I hadn't solved, which is why do women everywhere in the developed world live longer than men, about five to seven years? And I discovered at the end of that process that one of the reasons is that women are more likely to prioritize, develop, groom, build, all those things to their, their friends, their family. Um, their relationships at work, wherever they find themselves. And this has a direct impact, as Judith just mentioned, on their health and how long they live. So that's where I started with that. But I, I did want to add something about what you said earlier, that actually a very new finding is that it's not only our subjective experience of loneliness, but it's also whether we're physically alone, whether we choose it or not, that has an impact on our health and our resilience and our longevity. A new study that just came out in March 2015 by Julianne holt Lundstedt showed that your ability to survive longer, to outlive your peers, is reduced by 30% if you're lonely, if you're socially isolated, or if you live alone, whether you choose to or not. But I guess, it, uh, uh, well, you tell me, does it go without saying that you can live alone but not be lonely, and you can live with someone and be lonely? Exactly. However, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. If you live alone, it still statistically reduces your lifespan. Hmm. Interesting. Louise, you've been doing lots of research on this uh, subject for about 15 years, right. uh, including with um, John Cassioppo, uh, who's uh, you know one of the... Uh, widely recognized leaders in this field. And I, I just wonder if you can uh, help us understand more about what you know of this subject today that say you didn't know maybe a decade and a half ago. Hmm. A lot that I didn't know a decade and a half ago. When we started this research, we were essentially studying young adults, typical college population that uh, academics find easily, readily available to study. And there already we saw differences between lonely and non-lonely young adults in, for example, how well they regulated their blood pressure. Their blood pressure levels were actually comparable, <clears throat> but the physiological underpinnings, if you want to call it that, of, of how they regulated their blood pressure differed in a way that we thought, you know, if this is how lonely people regulate their blood pressure, essentially by clamping down on their um, arteries and creating more pressure that way, then with time they're going to be the ones that are prone to getting high blood pressure, hypertension. And in fact, when we started studying older people in a community sample here in Chicago, that's exactly what we found. They had higher blood pressure and their blood pressure increased more rapidly over a four-year follow-up than their less lonely counterparts. We've also seen sleep differences, and this is seen by a number of researchers uh, in a number of locations in a number of countries around the world. There's something about loneliness that affects how we sleep. And it isn't how much we sleep, it's more how well we sleep. So lonely people tend to have more sleep interruptions. They wake up feeling less rested, less capable of handling the stresses of the day. Um, as Judith mentioned, the immune effects or the genetic effects. So we've seen that gene expression, genes that get turned on or off, are influenced by the, how lonely people are. So the genes that get turned on or off, or both in the case of lonely people, have a certain profile that sets the lonely people up for being <clears throat> less able to handle infection, more prone to hyperinflammation in the body, inflammation being a process that feeds toward cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and so on. Um, and then, of course, mortality. And I was, going, I was thinking exactly of that same holt Lundsted uh, study that reviewed essentially 70 studies on the topic and found a nice overall 
result that is very consistent across studies that there is an increased risk of, of mortality for lonely, isolated, or living alone individuals. Judith, let me follow up with you. You're coming to us, of course, from the biggest city in your country or mine right now, and yet I suspect the amount of loneliness in New York City is really quite significant. And I wonder if you could tell us what societal changes have happened, say, over the last couple of decades that have increased the amount of loneliness that people are experiencing. Well, I don't know if loneliness is actually higher in cities or in neighborhoods. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to tell you a story about Louise that, uh, and then turn this over to her to talk about it. But we certainly do see an increase of number, in number of people who live alone uh, in small apartments. We see delays in marriage. Uh, and we see uh, a kind of um, architecture in New York City in particular and other cities that takes people off the street and takes them away from the kind of spontaneous communities that form uh, perhaps in smaller, uh, in, in neighborhoods with lower house, smaller houses uh, and more street life. So the, it, there's a Jane, Jane Jacobs talked about this in her uh, accounts of urban planning. Um, if you if you don't focus on the street and you build up, then people will be lonely. But there's also all kinds of neighborhood factors. So I'll tell a little story. When I was reporting my story on loneliness, I spent a lot of time in Chicago and I spent a lot of time with Louise. And one of the things she did is she took me from neighborhood to neighborhood in Chicago and talked about the different factors that will account for a high loneliness rating on the scale that uh, on the test that she and Cassiopo used. So now I'm going to turn this over to you, Louise, and get you to tell us about okay. that and, and what those different measurements are. I'm still trying to figure out how I lost control yeah. of the program, and, and, and now apparently Judith is moderating it. But that's okay. I want to hear the end of the story. So, Louise, go ahead. Let's hear it. Yeah. Well, we were looking at neighborhoods that had been classified on a number of criteria, like uh, essentially how run down or, or um, dangerous they might be. So did they have neighborhood block groups or didn't they? Were there boarded up buildings? Were the streets kept clean or not? Um, were they adjacent to railroad tracks or not? Uh, various markers of communities that might be more or less advantaged. And loneliness tends to follow the advantage. And the idea there is, and we had some measures of this, is that when you live in a neighborhood that isn't um, advantaged, if it has uh, high crime rates, for example, uh, people living in those communities tend to become less trusting, not only of their neighbors, but of people in general. When you become less trusting, you're probably less likely to go out. You're more likely to be confined to your house that's going to limit your social interactions. And those, those interactions you do have, if they're not really disclosing, if you are less trusting, there may be not the quality of interactions that you might want, all of which could contribute to higher levels of loneliness. Hmm. Barbara, what about seniors? Are seniors lonelier today than they were a generation ago? Mm -hmm. Well, that is hard to determine, but what we know is that Loneliness and social isolation have been identified as problems associated with old age since the late 40s. There is a very famous study by Sheldon in the UK in 1948. Uh, what we know now is that reduced social networks, declining health, living alone, or living in social institutions such as long-term care facilities, retirement communities, and so on, put seniors at risk of social isolation and loneliness. Some authors also say that changes in family structures might be contributing to this, because we move from extended families to more nuclear families. But I think we have a very romantic vision of what was to be old in the past. We have this idea, for instance, of the influential village elders of the traditional societies but an elder was an adult male in his late 40s. So it's different from what an elder is today. Pre, in pre-industrial families, old age was seen as a disease. So it's quite different, right? And we know that we are living longer. I mean, between 1800 and 2012, life expectancy of the global population grew from an average of 30 years to an average of 70 years. And we know this will continue, that life expectancy is continuing to increase. We know now with some new projections that older adults, seniors, will exceed the number of children for the first time in 2047. Hmm. So as we grow older, 
as we age, we go through those life transitions, life course events that may make us at a risk of social isolation and loneliness. For instance, retirement, we lose frequent contact with our coworkers, mm -hmm. or frailty, we lose mobility, uh, widowhood, loss of relatives and friends, and so on. So as we grow older, we are going through these life transitions, but we also are facing new demographic patterns that show that we will have smaller social network networks because we will have fewer children. On the issue of elders, let me go to Susan and have you tell us about Sardinia, where you went for your book and what you learned when you were there. It was a great surprise when we arrived because I was there to research the book and to uh, really get the testimony of elders because in these villages in Sardinia, it was not as you say, it was that the elders were tremendously respected well looked after, always surrounded by not just friends and family, but the priest, the shopkeeper, the baker, everybody was there. So this was a surprise to me because I arrived with my tape recorder and hoped to get them speaking about their lives, what kept them alive so long, and there were essentially always six to ten people in the room. It was very different than the way we age here, which, as Barbara explained, can be very solitary, you know. It can be essentially you know, solo living, for example, has increased 300% in just the last few decades. A lot of older people, because they can, live by themselves. They don't live with their children. Whereas in Sardinia, essentially, you are never alone, whether you like it or not. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Do they do it better? They do it better because they have hugely increased rates of survival. So there are 10 times the number of centenarians in these villages than there are in Canada, the United States, or even mainland Europe. There are six times as many as on other parts of Sardinia and Italy. So we do know that about 25% of the variance is accounted for by genetic factors, but 75% is really social factors. These people are always included, they're respected, and the data bear out the experience that they're never left to feel alone, unaccounted for. But one more follow-up. You said they're never alone whether they like it or not. Are, yes. there, are there some of them who would prefer a little more solitude and don't get it? It's hard to know that because there's no research on that. But I do know that whether they're cheerful or grumpy or introverted or extroverted, they're always surrounded. And I do <laughs> want to get back to the introvert-extrovert kind of dichotomy because the research tells us that even introverts need social contact. They just need to control it a little more. They may need to decide who and when. So Sheldon Cohn's research at, uh, in, in Pittsburgh tells us that introverts who stick to themselves, for example, who communicate mostly online, they catch more colds. They, they are not able to fight off infection. So it is actually a myth that introverts need less or don't need it at all. Interesting. Louise, you wanted to follow up on that? Yeah, a couple of things. I, I would agree with this latter point. It's not that introverts don't need connections, but they just might, need, not, might not need the large network that an extrovert would feel comfortable with. Um, yeah, a couple of things. One is the idea of loneliness um, in older people changing. That's a really difficult question because there isn't a lot of data on it, and yet the best data on the subject comes from the Netherlands um, where they did a comparison of loneliness from 1996, I think it was, to 2002. And what they found was that the loneliness levels, no, I take that back, that was 1992 to 2006, so it was a longer period of time. And what they found is that the level of loneliness, and you can measure loneliness as a uh, measure it in intensity, not just whether it exists or not, did not change over that time period prevalence, like how many people say they are sometimes lonely or often lonely, there was a small increase from 16 to 21 percent of these older adults who felt sometimes lonely between 92 and 2006. The change in those who said they were often lonely, not significant, 4 to 5 percent, both occasions. So uh, I think that speaks to what we don't know yet about whether it's really increasing. One of the other things that came up when we were talking about living alone and the Sardinians having people around and you asked, you know, what if they don't want to be alone or what if they do want to be alone and they don't get that opportunity. In this country, it's much more normative to be living um, autonomously and independently for good or ill. It seems that we've become accustomed to that in some way. It seems that the connection between living alone and loneliness is weakening over time. And I think of young adults and older adults contributing to that. If you choose to live alone, 
you have options, but you choose to live alone. That isn't going to be lonely making. Southern European countries are much lonelier than Northern European countries, despite the fact that they have very tight families. Part of it is believed to be that in the North, if you're living alone, that's a desirable state and you don't feel lonely in it. In the South, the expectation is that families are going to be there for you and you will be living with them at, at, at best. And that not being fulfilled can lead them to feeling lonely. Judith, what does your research and your experience tell us about whether there's a gender gap on the issue of loneliness? Well, I gather that there is. Again, I am not an expert, but um, my research told me that any marginalized group, any group likely to experience rejection, will sort of register as having greater loneliness on these scales. Um, and this is something that uh, a wonderful psychologist named Steve Cole studied um, when he studied young men with HIV in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and he discovered that uh, gay men in the closet died sooner uh, from HIV AIDS than men who were out. And uh, part of this had to do that they feared rejection more. They might feel as though they experienced rejection more. Gay men on the whole uh, experienced rejection more, especially then. Um, and people who had that experience tended to die sooner. And so the, the consensus is that if you're part of a stigmatized minority, and women, you know, though not stigmatized, certainly experience discrimination uh, on a regular basis, that rejection will sort of show up as greater loneliness. Susan, anything in your research about whether this is a greater phenomenon among men versus women? Yes, I think women are lonelier than men, and I think it has to do with what Louise referred to before as expectation. Yeah. Women expect that they will be connected to others, and they expect that they will be included. And it's, I would say, much more common for them to seek that out. And if they are not included, they feel this often as physical pain, hmm. as something that, and in fact, neurologically, rejection and loneliness is, ex is very close to physical pain in the brain. So I think it's not so much a question of whether they have larger networks, and yes, they tend to have larger networks, but their expectation of what this will fulfill for them. So for example, when I did research on, on women in the workplace, many of them put as their number one priority that they work with people they like and respect, as opposed to, say, compensation. Money. And that was a big surprise to me. Interesting. Let's play some tape here. Uh, the University of Wisconsin psychologist Harry Harlow did a number of experiments with rhesus monkeys in the 50s and 60s that may be relevant to this discussion. You two can watch the clip here in the studio on the monitors. You two out of town, you'll be able to hear it through your earpieces. Let's roll that clip, please. In a classic continuing study, infant monkeys are removed from the mother at birth and raised in semi-isolation. Other individuals can be seen and heard but there is no physical contact, no interaction. Mother is a bit of plastic and shaggy cloth, a doll with no life of its own, but capable of nourishing the life of an infant. The monkey will come to depend upon this doll to satisfy basic necessities of life. Not only nourishment, but a deeper psychological need for comfort and security. In primate infants, there is an instinctive need to cling to another body, soft and warm. Now let's acknowledge off the top here, uh, Judith, that uh, some people thought those experiments were kind of cruel on, on animals. But having said that, was there anything, uh, to your knowledge, that emerged uh, from those experiments that enhanced our understanding of loneliness? Well, the whole paradigm in psychology shifted because of Harry Harlow. Um, and yes, the experiments were horrific. Um, less the ones that were shown than some of the ones where uh, baby monkeys were put at the bottom of, you know, boxes they couldn't get out of all by themselves and came out just completely withdrawn and non-functional. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there are rules now about what you can and cannot do. But what was learned was that we are not little, I mean, we and primates and animals are not tiny little automa automata that respond to stimuli, which was the sort of basic premise of behavioralism, but that we need love 
and we need attachment in order to thrive and grow. And that's not just psychologically, but neurologically and, um, you know, endocrinologically and, you know, any number of ogically's. Um, we, it completely shifted the way we think about infancy, childhood, and the role of love in human development. So let's talk, Barbara, about electronic social networks and whether or not any of that can, can help deal with the loneliness that we're talking about. What's your thought on that? Well, um, the research shows that, for instance, electronic digital networks or the internet is actually supporting active social connectedness. And we can see that in the last 10 years there's been consistent sociological re research that shows that, including the work by Professor Barry Wellman here in Toronto in the East York series of studies that shows that the intranet is actually supporting that social connectedness. Now having said that, I need to, <laughs> to clarify that technologies can be both used in a positive or in a negative way. It depends on how you use it. Now, the research has been systematic in the sense that internet is bringing us positive effects in terms of sociability and social connectedness. So people that are really active socially online are also active offline. So the internet is not displacing face-to-face -face communication or destroying sense of community, is supplementing our face-to-face -face communication. That's the research that we have Susan, so Susan, you agree far. with that? <laughs> Not entirely. I think it's more shaded mm -hmm. th than that answer. I think that I would say that the metaphor is that the rich get richer, the poor get poorer when it comes to the internet. So it depends who's using it. If you're active, extroverted, outgoing person, you will use your online networks to do more of that, to make arrangements to go out for dinner or see an art gallery or to get together in person and they kind of feed off each other. If you are more introverted or part of an isolated group, for example, say a new immigrant uh, to Canada or somebody who has various kinds of disabilities, the internet often does displace your social contact, your real social contact, because let's face it, it's the path of least resistance. So we have kind of a paradox where it does wonderful things for some people, but for other people, it does isolate them. Hmm. What's Facebook depression? Well, Facebook, Facebook depression is, you know, often there's, the, the research tells us that people often look to their online networks the way they used to look for at television, for company. And so when they're feeling lonely or distressed, they will often go and communicate more with strangers or semi-strangers on Facebook than they will go out and seek people in person. And that the effect on their mood is that it decreases their mood. So that's what Facebook depression is. And, and I will add on the, on the theme of kind of more isolated groups, you would think that these online networks would be a huge boon to mm -hmm. populations like newly arrived uh, students from China or people on the autistic spectrum. But what we're finding is that there's a negative correlation. The more they're online, the less they make friends offline. Hmm. The more, so the more they're online, the more contacts they have online, but the lonelier they are. It doesn't do anything for how they feel. And that's really what's important, as Louise pointed out, is your subjective experience of loneliness. So Louise, important that the connections you make on social media not take the place of face-to-face -face contact in real life, right? That's exactly right. Just thinking of what you get in a face-to-face -face uh, interaction, it's a multi-sensory experience. You're seeing somebody, you're hearing them, you're smelling them, you're possibly touching them. All of that makes for what is experienced as a gratifying relationship and uh, a virtual interaction is it's like a low calorie version of that. It's not to say it's, it doesn't have any value. You can imagine a situation of grandparents Skyping their grandchildren who they wouldn't see any other way that has value. But it doesn't have the depth um, and the lasting power that a face-to-face -face interaction would have. Judith, I have to ask you about a phenomenon that uh, I see this all the time. If you're in a restaurant, it doesn't matter. Four people sitting at a table They'll talk for 10 minutes and then there'll be a lull in the conversation and all four people will grab for their devices and even though they are with each other, they are not really present with each other. They're all, you know, heads down praying as if uh, looking at their blackberries. Um, why, why do people do that? 
Um, Sherry Turkle just wrote a book. Sherry Turkle, the MIT, uh, I think she's a sociologist, might be a psychologist. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Sociologist. Uh, wrote a wonderful bo a book called Alone Together, and that's what we are. We're <laughs> alone together. Um, I saw a wonderful thing on Facebook recently uh, that was a picture of a billboard that said, what wonderful place are you going to this weekend so you can stare at your phone? Um, you know, uh, social norms have changed and these things have simply taken over our social lives. There's a, there have been studies that show that we get little dopamine hits every time we get an email, whether or not it's an email from somebody we actually want to hear from or not. And that's actually addictive. And I think that's actually starting to sap our manners and our ability to look each other in the eye and interact. In my family, we ban devices at dinner. We ban devices on family trips. Um, we ban devices at night so that I can read to my children. Um, because otherwise, they just take over. Um, and uh, to go back to the point about Facebook depression, I just wanted to say one thing, which is that at the, at, during, uh, in the years when email was first becoming popular, the author Nicholson Baker said of email, it's just one more way to feel rejected. In other words, you check your email, there's nothing from anybody you wanted to <laughs> hear from, and you feel lonely. Same with Facebook. Late at night, I'm bored, I'm lonely, I check it. There's nobody posting whom I know, and I just feel sort of, lonelier than I did before. Hmm. And I might add to that, Please. that it's not, you are not meeting real people on Facebook. You're, re, you're meeting personae that they've crafted for public consumption. It's like an advertisement for themselves. Hmm. Or like people used to give slideshows of their holidays where you know, essentially they're there looking happy with their arms around their children and friends and spouse. That's what it's like to go on Facebook. So if you go there when you're already feeling lousy, then you see all of these images and posts which are about other people feeling good and their achievements. And this makes you feel worse than you did before because right. you feel like, well, am I the only one <coughs> whose life is subpar? Hmm. Yes, I would like to add something right. as well. Sure, Barbara. Because all the research that I've been seeing for the last 10 years shows that, in fact, internet users have more offline contacts and more close friends and non-users. So I've, I'm always afraid that we are kind of getting into a very dystopian view of technology. There's positive and there's negative effects. But we need to see that the research shows that in fact the internet is not supplement, is not, sorry, replacing offline communication, and it was not the purpose. It is supplementing it. So I feel that every time we talk about technology, every time a new technology is introduced in society, there's a period of moral panic. You know, the printing press was going to destroy language and memory. Well, no, uh, but you would be concerned if we somehow lost the ability to look at each other in the eye and actually sure. have a conversation because we're all into our devices. Uh, sure, but it, that's not well, what's happening. We still have face-to-face -face communication. It's not not supplementing it. And research shows that, for instance, the number, the number of people that have virtual friends, it's a, very, it's a very small number of people. And when we meet people online, we normally meet them offline. We call this migratory friendships. Hmm. So, so we have different positions on this. At least my position is based on the research that I've been seeing for okay, the last I hear you. 10 let's, years. Let's have Susan, I would like to add something, Judith, and then Susan. Uh, okay. Yep, Judith and Susan. Uh, I, yeah, I would like to add something, which is I have a number of friends uh, on Facebook with whom I start these exchanges and Twitter, too. And they get very heated and very excited. Uh, and then I see them and we just pick up the conversation uh, as if you know we had been speaking. And it intensifies and deepens our friendship. That's absolutely right. And I have a number of friendships like that where casual acquaintances who I might have run into at a party become real acquaintances because we've discovered that we have these common interests. So it actually does deepen certain relationships. And then I have hundreds of friends, quote unquote friends, on Facebook. I have no idea who they are. I will never meet them. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I just ignore everything they have to say. <laughs> so they're not really friends. That's they're not the point. Friends yeah. in inverted they're commas. They're friends. friends. Wait, Susan. I think it's yeah. really quite true that if we paint this as a black white picture, we're going to miss the important information here. And I will say that it's often raised as kind of a, a shibboleth or some sort of scary monster that technology, you know, we've been afraid of other technologies before. But there's also the opposite point of view is that we have to examine what's happening to our culture. And there is a new shift. And to be frank, 
In previous technologies, they were also seen as a panacea to all of society's ills. For example, John Maynard Keynes predicted that by the time we were living in the century today, there'd be so little work to do that our major problem would be what to do with all that leisure time because we'd only have to work two days a week. Hmm. Of course, that's not true. So essentially, I think it's, it's not really useful to look at technology as bad or good, but to look at how individuals or certain groups are using it and to either amplify their contact or if they're replacing their contact, how can, that, how can we get that message across that as Louise and Judith and all the research tells us, and in the Village Effect I explain this very clearly, that without physical contact, we're missing a whole cascade of biological events that we need to survive and thrive. Talk to us, Barbara, about, down to a few minutes here, let's see if I can get a couple of more subjects uh, on sure. the table. In touch. Your right. Tag Labs is doing this in-touch program. What is that? Right. So we're developing this technology for seniors. It's a, tech, a communication technologies, technology developed for seniors that are frail, that are, uh, they have fewer opportunities for social contact. We are not trying to replace face-to-face -face contact. We, of course, know that face-to-face -face contact is fundamental. Uh, but there are people that are too frail, that are institutionalized or live alone and have fewer and fewer opportunities for social connectedness, for meaningful social relationships. So this was an idea of our director, Ron Becker, as he saw his sister uh, battling with MS and she moved from being extremely connected, socially connected, to be uh, extremely isolated when she was living in a rehab hospital in the US. We weren't able to develop this technology in time for her, but it's an app for in touch that allows seniors to communicate with their family members and friends in a very simple way. It's a very accessible, simple interface. There's no typing because we work with seniors that have motor or uh, dexterity problems. So is this so a video thing? They can't what? type. So I'll show you. I'll okay. try to explain you. <laughs> so it's an app. You can, it's like a digital picture frame. You scroll through your contacts, you select the family member that you want to communicate with, and then you have four options. You can send a preset message that says, I'm thinking of you, or what are you up to? You, then you can send a video, a photo, or, or a picture. And uh, that goes to the family members or the friend's email, and then can reply with text, audio, video, or also a picture. This is perfect if you're starting to suffer from dementia issues too, I would imagine, eh? We are still testing with people with early dementia. Huh. Uh, our tests have been mainly with people that have motor impairment, impairments, dexterity problems, but it's been, the, the results are really interesting and show that these people feel that they can adopt this technology because it's simple enough for them and uh, that uh, they feel that it han enhances their communication, especially with their grandchildren, because they see their grandchildren as the digital generation, and they feel that by using this, they're closer to them. Hmm. Louise, I'm literally down to my last minute here. Can I ask you whether you think technology is going to be kind of potentially the great savior here to prevent us from being lonely going forward? I wouldn't call it the great savior. I would just reiterate the point that uh, technology has the capacity to supplement face-to-face. -face. I don't think we run the risk of letting technology overtake us. I think the motivation to connect socially is a biological need that is built into us. We are not going to lose that in the face of technology. It would be interesting to see if, in fact, what we're seeing is just a novelty phenomenon, much as what television was in its early years, and it'll all level out. But I think there's hope for technology to be used to supplement it if it is designed well, as Barbara was explaining, and if it is used appropriately with an eye to who we are as a social species. Gotcha. Thanks so much, everybody. We never mentioned Eleanor Rigby once on this program, but we could have. <laughs> Judith Shulovitz, the New York Times journalist, The Lethality of Loneliness in the New Republic is her contribution to this discussion. Judith, thanks for being there from New York City for us. Thank you. Louise Hockley, the senior research scientist at the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. Thank you, Louise. Susan Pinker, author of The Village Effect, developmental psychologist. Welcome home, shall we say, back to the great white north. And Barbara Barbosa Nevish, Associate Director, Technologies for Aging Gracefully Labs, the sociologist, U of T. Thanks so much for being here as well. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.